who will come up and introduce himself more thoroughly. But his name is Rusty Bailey, and he's the mayor for Riverside. And he will be happy to take questions and answers, questions from you. And we have a microphone set up over here. And again, let me please strongly encourage the students, don't be shy, come up, uh, ask him really, really tough and mean-spirited questions. <laughs> uh, he, can, he can take it. Okay. Leave this on, you get the handhold. Mic. Maybe I'll just go to questions right now, if that's how we're going to do it. <laughs> I don't need to present anything. I think you all know, know enough by now to whether or not you, uh, you want to get into this business, right? You're still here, people that are still here. I don't know, I can't believe you're still here on a Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Um, I hope I, can, hope I can give you my best. It's been, it's been a good week, but Fridays are always um, uh, a little taxing for me, and, and I still have one more event to go to tonight, which probably would be more entertaining for you if you want to come see me karaoke at the VF, local VFW uh, tonight. You can, you can let me know afterwards, and we'll give you the directions. Let me grab my, my stuff. I usually need more space. That's, this is all I give educators these days is, you know, uh, I'm going to work from over here because I have some room over here. Where's Tyler Maderi? He left his stuff here. Is he still around? Oh, yeah? Okay. So, camp. I never thought I'd be going back to, to camp, but here I am, and I appreciate the invitation, Dean DeLaliker, thank you for, for bringing me out of City Hall. It's always good to get off of that campus and onto your campus and uh, spend some time with, with students and prospective students my understanding, um, for the master's degree. You'll see that I have something in common with you already. Um, I don't know if you have a BS, that's kind of funny, in political science, right? <laughs> but when you, when you go to West Point, you have to take math and physics, and you know, that's how they haze you. Uh, <laughs> so, so I got a BS. I am a BSer of political science and actually international relations, and then um, did some stuff in the Army and made my way um, back to Riverside and over to UCLA and on to Washington, D.C. and back to, well, the reason I came back here the second time was because I married up. I married a, a Highlander uh, who graduated from UCR in two, excuse me, 1993 and is an educator and got me into education then. That's a pretty, pretty crazy story if you want to ask about that. Taught civics for a few years at my alma mater, Poly High School. Actually, my grandpa graduated in 26, my dad in 56, and I graduated in 1990. So Riverside has been my home, my family's home for more than 100 years. One of the reasons I'm the mayor of my hometown is because of that lineage and those roots and connections uh, that I have here in this, in this city. And so now I am, again, uh, a reelected mayor of, of Riverside, 12th largest city in the state of California, 59th largest in the, in the country. I don't know if you've heard of St. Louis and Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, but we're the same size, but we don't have what? We don't have a professional sports team. So if you would, if you would have plop us down in the Midwest, we would be on the same level playing field as those big cities of the Midwest. People don't realize, you know, we're overshadowed by our big brother, Los Angeles, right? The, the quarterback of the team. And then you have the Orange County, the beauty queen, the homecoming queen, right? And then you have San Diego, the surfer dude, you know? And then there's, and there's Riverside out here in inland SoCal. Amen to that. Go Highlanders. I was gonna end my my session was saying, go Highlanders. I'll begin with that. Um, but I always, uh, you know, when I, when I give comments, gratitude, philosophy, and a challenge. So I've given gratitude to, to UCR for giving me an awesome wife and for, for inviting me out here today. And I'll talk a little bit more about my, our philosophy, at least in Riverside, some of the challenges we face 
a little bit about the public policy process. I assume that you all went through that somewhat today, the decision-making process and uh, policy analysis is, is the training um, that you received in the master's program. And then I'll give you, give you a challenge at the end. And that's how we'll progress through. But if you, do have, if you do have questions, don't be afraid as we go through this to raise your hand, and I'll try to answer them as we go. Otherwise, you know, we'll have plenty of time at the end. Um, I'm going to inundate you. I think I probably have more information in here than I need to at the end of the day. Um, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly just to set the stage for the question and answer time. Is that cool? I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother reading off the slides or getting into a discussion about each one of the slides, but there is some good data there and some questions that you might want to write down as you, as you see some of the information that I, that I put up. Um, all right. So obviously, you know, I, I chose public service. That's, that's the meaningful career that, that path that, that I chose. Um, and, and I did have a choice, and I haven't offered jobs in the private sector, but um, I'm not in it for the money. <laughs> Actually, every time I've taken a job, I've taken a pay cut. You know, as you move from D.C. or L.A. or wherever you are, uh, you know, and you come back to Riverside, things, things change, including the salary range. Um, I'd be making more as, as a teacher in, in public high school than I would as the mayor of a, of a large city in the state, but that's, that's how it's set up. So you're not getting, hopefully, anybody leaving right now, you're not getting into this business for, for the money? Okay, you're still here. You're still here. But again, it's a meaningful career path because you get to change the lives of the public. You get to work on problems that are, are real. Um, I love the story. I, I see Barry Wallerstein here, and, and um, I love the story. Anybody know, anybody heard of Professor Leverage? Anybody raise your hand if you know Professor Leverage or have had his class. A few of you, okay. Uh, he was the former mayor, mayor before me, 19 years in office as the mayor, 14 as a city councilman. Can you imagine 33 years in public office? He deserves whatever you give him. <laughs> if you see him, take him to lunch, take him to coffee. Um, just, just the patience and perseverance alone of serving for 33 years, there's no way that I, I don't think anybody else will be able to, to do that uh, because of the demands of public office and the, the challenges and social media. <laughs> um, but his story is that he came from, from the Bay Area, from Stanford, uh, with his PhD to Riverside. And as he was flying through the, the smog layer in a helicopter to the municipal airport, he asked the question, what is that? Oh, well, that's, that's the smog layer. It's just, that's Riverside. You know, that's what we're used to. When I was growing up here, I, I could barely see Box Springs, the sea on the, on the mountain. But because of his efforts at creating a regional approach to solving that problem, because smog doesn't know city boundaries or county boundaries, right? And it blew from Los Angeles and the ports all the way to Riverside and stuck up against the hills. And so we lived with that for many years. The smog capital of the United States is what we were painted. That picture was painted of, of Riverside. And so he truly deserves a lot of the credit, along with the, the folks that came together on solving that public policy issue of, of that day. Um, air quality management, you know, became now uh, uh, what you, you know, it, it became common, right? Back, back in the day, it's, it's smog, now it's, now it's air quality. And you can't see it anymore. We've got it to a point of particulate matter instead of, you know, the, the smog layer that keeps you from seeing the mountains. But the point there is, in the beginning of this, is there's public policy issues that are out there, and it takes it, leadership, and it takes uh, 33 years of service sometimes uh, to make, to make a, 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 well, maybe not that long to make a difference. Hopefully, uh, you know, that difference was made earlier than 33 years, but he continues to serve, um, and, and he's uh, definitely a, a legend uh, in this area, in this region, and, and so there's a lot of gratitude that goes to, to Mayor Leverage and Professor Leverage for the, for the continuity that he brought to the table, and so I point is that I, I hope that I can continue that, that continuity uh, and stability approach to being uh, a mayor of a big city and focusing on the, the big issues of, of the day. 
So again, there's, there's Riverside. We are an urban city. And one of the competitive advantages we have is our historic and vibrant downtown. If you haven't been down, down there to see the Mission Inn or the Food Lab, anybody been to the Food Lab recently? The Foodie, foodie Nation has taken over downtown Riverside. And, um, you know, we probably are the only city that uh, could compete for a headquarters like Amazon HQ2, and, and we did with, with, with the county. But I place this up there um, in terms of who are the urban cities in inland Southern California that could compete for employers, and that's ultimately how we uh, determine if we're successful or not as politicians these days. That's the bread and butter of getting reelected is how many jobs you've created, right, or quality jobs. Um, that's typically the, the marker of success as in our business as we go through that. And whether that's good or bad, I'll leave that up to you. But that, for a while, has been the bottom line. Now that we have low unemployment, um, maybe we can talk about other things. And, and we'll see in the next election cycle in 2020 what those things are. But in the past, it has been, you know, who is going to employ this next generation and how are we going to um, attract the right jobs to our city, to our region. And uh, Riverside is making a case and has made the case of being that, that urban environment, that, uh, that, that place where a headquarters could come and bring those jobs. And, and the case in point is California Air Resources Board who looked at Pomona and looked at Riverside and competitively we went after that 400 employee base laboratory in El Monte uh, and successfully w were awarded from the state of California that, that headquarters that is being built right now over on, on Iowa near University Avenue. So $400 million uh, invested in Riverside, the largest line item in the state of California budget because of a group that came together and, and, um, and pitched California, state of California, California Resources Board as being the next place for you to bring your, your employment. Um, so can we do it again? Is Google, Microsoft, Uber, Lyft, the bird, are they, is their headquarters gonna come to, to Riverside? You know, perhaps, perhaps. Here's the mayor's role, the hats typically um, th that I wear, or I, I'm a representative, I'm a problem solver, I'm a decision maker. So I represent the city wherever I go, whether it's at the Southern California Association of Governments, or whether it's in our nine sister cities from Vietnam to Korea to uh, Germany to, to Mexico. And that's, that's kind of the fun part of the job, uh, being a representative and getting some international travel in. And, and then I have to come back every Tuesday night, Ken knows this, and endure city council meetings that sometimes go till 10 or 11. I think we're going to have a, another warehouse. I don't know if you refer to the last warehouse, but another warehouse discussion coming up. Uh, and I'd invite you all down to see what retail government is like. Again, any Tuesday night uh, at 7 o'clock, public comment, followed by a discussion calendar of enthralling public policy issues such as development and uh, marijuana use, uh, marijuana policy. Um, and I'll show you today, you know, what do we do with the bird? Anybody, anybody ridden a bird yet? You know what the bird is? The scooters that have flocked to, to the city? Okay, we'll talk, talk more about that later. Uh, public policy, this is a definition from, from my walk that, that I thought was uh, interesting and, and at least uh, a discussion point that we can, we can talk about later. But when you look at this, the re response that I, re you know, that I got was, if, if government chooses not to invest in education or transportation infrastructure, environmental protection, you know, does that affect the public? Certainly. So we have to study both and, right? We, we need to study both successes in public policy, the good things that happened through decisions that were made, but we also need to... Um, to study and analyze the failures in the system. And here's the most condensed, I don't know if 
uh, public policy school, school uses an eight-step approach to uh, decision-making process or a six-step approach, but here's, here's the four-stepper. Here's the most basic that I, that I found. And I'd ask you the question, what, what's the most important step? You can yell it out, yell it out. What's the most important step? Okay. If you're a baby, what's the most important step? The first one, right? The first one. If you don't identify the problem, rightly so, if you can't identify that problem, then how can you solve it? Right? So that's where you need to spend the most, the most of your time. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. And when I show you some other slides, you can, you can think about that. If we define the problem um, in education, you know, on demographics or student diversity uh, versus, versus poverty, you know, will the outcome, will the decision be different? Will the actions we take change? You know, probably. And, and, and if you look at the last 10 to 15 years of public policy making education, you're seeing some changes in education policy because they're looking at the problem a little bit differently, whether it's in English language learning or whether it's in um, special education or whether it's in poverty versus, versus just the demographics of, of individuals, the ethnicity of individuals. So, yes, action, nothing's going to happen unless who has to take the action? It comes back to good policy analysis by you all that ultimately comes to the decision makers that have to push, push the button. And so that's the reality of it, right? It's, it's, it looks simple. Four steps. Hey, we can get that done. We'll take care of it. <laughs> we can study and analyze and come up with criteria and then we'll send it to the city council and, and then, or state legislature or Congress. And as you see, even some of the more simple decisions like appointing somebody to the Supreme Court, you know, you would think maybe that's simple, but that's the reality of it, right? <laughs> You've got all sorts of different ways you can get off track and, um, You know, some, some of the easiest ways to get off track are introducing politics in the process. You know, and you, I remember talking about different lenses in public policy school that you have to, to put on, you know, different glasses, whether you're looking through the human resources uh, lens or whether you're looking through uh, the finance lens or whether you're looking through the political lens. Each one of those is going to have a different focal point for you. And, and so um, just when you think you have a good set of recommendations, I've been a policy analyst myself and federal government and otherwise, you know, here comes a politician. <laughs> and, and they're going to maybe not even read your recommendation before they make a decision. And you have to be okay with that. Um, it might be frustrating, but that's, that's your job. So here's some trends. Here's some trends um, in, in policy not just locally, but as you can see, it makes its way um, to, to the federal decision-making process that affect us locally. And I'll talk about a few of the examples in, in my term, 10, 11 years now in his elected off, office. Um, there's a, an article, Joel Kotkin, I think. Anybody read New Geography and Restoring Localism? You may have read that article recently. You see that one? Uh, I don't know if I'll read this whole thing, but as you, as you all peruse that, he says, Americans are increasingly prisoners of ideology, back to philosophy. This is our philosophy lesson for the day, and our society is paying the price. We are divided along partisan lines to an extent that some are calling a soft civil war. <laughs> are we seeing that on TV right now in D.C. over a Supreme Court nominee? Pretty much. In the end, this benefits only ideological warriors and their funders. One key source of this deepening division is the relentless centralization that has overtaken both our economy and our politics. <laughs> Leaders of both parties have sat by while the forces of capital and government have centralized power and authority in ever fewer hands. And so he goes on to, to say basically the central authority is useful in such things as waging war, 
but a more expansive government has not, for example, improved education. You know, if you ask the president today, what should we do with the Department of Education, he might say delete, you know, or, or EPA, uh, or see, <laughs> you know, has, has, again, a more expansive government has not, for example, improved education or seen more poor students attending college. A half century after the Great Society legislation, poverty remains higher than it was before it began. So he calls it Leviathan, a reference. Uh, I think that's Machiavelli, right? It's grown immense, but it also has failed. And so the premise is, back to all politics is local, maybe all the, maybe all of the solutions as well should come from the local level and migrate their way up to the federal government to, to analyze and, and to pick and choose from. We'll come back to that. So a couple, again, of, of specific areas in terms of policy that we are having to respond to, react to. One of the reasons I got into this business, my dad was a, a judge. So everybody said, oh, what law school are you going to go to? And after watching his career and what he went through, and um, he had several death penalty cases, and it took a toll on him. And, and you know, I, I kind of was a rebel in high school. And so I said, I, I'm going to pivot to another, you know, I'm going to find another way. I don't think I want to be a lawyer. And, and I justified that by looking at the law. And I know I'm kind of, again, generalizing this. I have any lawyers in the room? Okay. Well, forgive me, please. Um, uh, looking back, maybe, maybe I should have gone to law school. <laughs> looking back, say you good? <laughs> no, looking back, maybe I should have gone to law school. I, um, but in my mind, it was, the law was reactionary, right? You're reacting to failures in society. And you can think, you know, failures in contracts and relationships and in, in, in government. And public policy was proact proactive in my mind, right? You're looking for solutions to prevent problems from happening. And so that's, you know what, that's how I'm going to justify going to policy school instead of law school, is I want to be proactive when I grow up. I'm still, by the way, growing up and trying to figure out what I'm going to do, ultimately. Um, but for now, I'm, I'm proud to be your mayor. So, I mean, online shopping. Who, who, who has purchased something online in the last month? Right in the last week. What about today? See? We don't get the sales tax from that, by the way. And the sales tax is 25% of our revenue source in the city. So can you imagine if 25% of our, of our revenue went away? That basically is our fire and police, you know, and that's not a good situation to be in. But that's the, that's the trend we're going to. Online sales versus sales locally at the plaza or somewhere else, okay? Federal state investments have weakened. Anybody heard of redevelopment? Redevelopment agencies have gone away. You'll see what the, how that impacted housing in a second. Unfunded mandates. Anybody heard of AB 109? They're pushing prisoners down to the local level, and some of them are put, being pushed out on our streets, but there's not enough money for probation and reentry programs, right? So unfunded mandates. They're, on, they're homeless now. You'll see a slide on that. Policy by ballot initiative. Who is going to vote for more taxes? Raise your hand if you're going to vote for more taxes. Well, thank you. I appreciate that because that's what the government, that's what pays my salary. Maybe I'll get a raise. I haven't had a raise in uh, f three or four years, I think. Um, I'm going to need more time. No, we'll get there. I got it. Ten minutes. We'll, we'll be good. I'll go through these real quick. So that's what's on the ballot right now. Roads. Who thinks our roads are failing? Really? You guys don't have cars then. You guys are riding your bikes around. Okay? Take a drive, not just in Riverside, but other, other go r drive Mission Boulevard through the Valley all the way to Pomona. Okay? Our roads are failing. We have a 61 pavement condition index in the city of Riverside. And if we don't double our budget on roads, we will go into the 50s. Anybody want to be a failure? Right? That's F grade for us. So if everybody votes no on Prop 6, or yes on Prop 6, excuse me, yes on Prop 6, if you vote yes on Prop 6, our roads are going to be failures, okay, throughout the state of California, not just in Riverside. But that's what we're putting on the ballot initiative, raise 
You know, get to raise your taxes. Don't we trust our representatives to make decisions for us? It's going to affect us at the local level, okay? And we don't have much control over that ballot initiative at the state, is my point. So economic development, I don't know if we have a quick video. This is what we're hoping to do in the city, grow our own entrepreneurs, okay? We're creating an innovation district, Metropolitan Revolution, Bruce Katz and his team at um, the Brookings Institute uh, convinced us of that, and then diversity of jobs. Obviously, just like a diverse portfolio of stocks, you want to have a diverse portfolio of jobs to, to create a healthy, healthy community. Does that, do I have to click on that to make it work? Or does it go? This is the fun part. This will wake you up. And feel free to stand up or go get more coffee if you're feeling tired. I could use some coffee. Did I screw something up? Help. See, I knew I was going to need your help. All right. So we're going to show you a cool marketing uh, video for, for the Innovation District that we're trying to attract businesses to come to, which is in between UCR and downtown. And again, is trying to marry up technology and education and transportation and housing all in one space, as you're seeing happen a little bit in downtown already. There we go. It'll explain it to you. There's a diverse portfolio of jobs. Look at that. Who wants, to, who wants to locate their business in the Innovation District now? Is that good marketing or what? Anybody? Okay. Well, maybe we need to do some work on that. <laughs> maybe you all can help us do some work on that. Again, we've got an economic development strategy that includes those, those three things. Um, now, here's on to some of the, the hard data that I bring to the table. Because truly, in my mind right now, 
in the long term, the biggest problem we have in the long term, not just in Riverside, but in the state of California, is, is housing. I don't, I, I'm really concerned where my, where my, where my daughter is going to be able to afford to live in, in, this, in Riverside. Median home price is pushing 400000 Wood Street's homes, $450,000. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't afford that. I don't know if, who's going to be able to afford that. So that's going to cut off the roots of my, my family. It's been here for six generations. I, I, can't, I can't swallow that pill. And so we're going to do everything we can. I'm going to do everything we can as a member of the South Southern California Association of Governments working on the regional housing needs assessment. If anybody heard about RENA numbers, I'm going to work on housing to, to try and find a way to keep Californians rooted here instead of pushing them to Texas or Nevada or Colorado and losing our talent. That's what I'm concerned about. That's what, put, that's what keeps me up at night, okay? And yes, it's a little bit personal, I guess, or uh, selfish to want my daughters to stay here, but um, that's, that's, what, that's the way it is. So housing shortage, 3% is our rental vacancy, okay? We don't have enough places to rent. Anybody new student here? Did you have a hard time finding a place to rent? Okay, we need to work on that for you, right? And this is the shortage. You can see the line where we should be. Do I just have a pointer on it? There we go, right? So there's the shortage. There's the housing shortage. Doesn't have to convince you. And, and, and that's all the affordable uh, housing that we're going to be able to, to produce 14,000. Or no, that's just, that's just new homes each year, the new legislation. So state legislation, state policy, is only incentivizing 14,000 units. So we've got, we got plenty to work on. Income versus rent. Um, income's falling. Rent increasing. That's not a good sign. Right? Uh, two-thirds. This is the two-thirds. Add those, those up right there. Can't afford apartments. Maybe you're in there. Okay. Subsidies. So remember I talked about um, no more help from the state or federal governments. That used to be... Is that the redevelopment? Yeah. There's, there's the redevelopment do dollars, redevelopment agencies. Governor Brown uh, killed that, took those away from us. All of that was affordable housing. Um, and, and so that's, that's the delta there. And then home ownership, you can see, is decreasing. So millennials are not buying homes. We've got to address that. We've got to What's identify the problem, right? So why aren't millennials buying homes? Would be a great question for somebody to, to figure out for us. Is it because we don't have the right uh, square footage, the right amenities, the right, is it not in the right spots? Urban, like I said, should Riverside be, be, be building more urban lifestyle, you know, with amenities? Is it a pool that we need to have for you, a jacuzzi, a workout room, a community garden for you to work in? So those are some questions that come out of this data, at least in my mind. And then homelessness is associated with housing. When you don't have enough housing, where, where do people have a choice to go? And so a lot of them are being put out. We've got to prevent homelessness by building more housing because they're living in their cars uh, and living in tents and on the streets. So you can see in, in a couple states, uh, it's increasing, California, New York. But why in Florida, Illinois, and Texas is it decreasing? Those are questions that we need policy analysts to answer for us. Okay, and same thing with education. As the trend goes to more students going to charter school, what does that mean for the public schools? They're losing enrollment. Teachers are starting to be let go or shifted to other, you know, other schools. Is that going to impact Riverside? Yeah, it is. We have more growth in our charter schools in Riverside than at any other, any other point, you know, as it shows you in our history, for example, Encore School Performing Arts, downtown Riverside started with 400 students the first year, went to 800 students the next year, now they're closer to 900 students the third year. Is that some pretty intense growth? Heck yeah, it is. And they're all in downtown, walking around downtown. What are the ramifications of that? Well, all of the, all of the space, the vacancies downtown have gone, gone away, and so the landlords are having a great time. All of the food vendors are having a good time. But what does it mean for traffic? There's, there's businesses that are pulling their hair out because kids are running around and yelling and screaming. And so does that impact the public? Certainly that impacts the public. Charter schools, affordability, 
uh, as you all know, is not getting any better. Um, loan balance, so loans have gone from, what was it, like 400 billion, and 10 years later is 1.2 trillion, tripled in, in 10 years, maybe less time. Is that a public policy issue of the day? Certainly, especially for you all. So how do we apply the decision-making process? Why should you go to a, a public policy school and get a master's and, and, and jump into this public service and uh, realm? Because of what I just showed you, we've got a lot of questions out there that we need to address. Um, back, to, back to that process. Um, and, and just recently, you know, some relevant topics, especially in Riverside or Bird Scooters. UCR, I think, has outlawed those on campus. Did you know that? Anybody hear that? Is that true? Okay. I got an email from, I think he was the COO or CEO of Bird on the day they dropped them off. He said, I dropped 500 scooters in your city. If you want to be indemnified, here's the letter. Sign it. Send it back. That was all the warning we had. Okay, but now we have 500 scooters, probably the majority of them being used inappropriately on sidewalks. They're supposed to be on bike lanes, right? And where do you park them? And do you have to wear a helmet? And what happens if someone gets injured? Who's, who's going to be liable? What if they hit a bump on the sidewalk or, you know, uh, the streets are not? <laughs> so you, there's a lot of questions, policy, public policy questions surrounding some of these disruptive technologies that we haven't answered yet. And so we need you. We need you to help us with those issues. As you, as you can see, uh, the beach <laughs> response there. Throw them in the trash. All right. So finally, I, I see the, the boss is up here to, to yank me. All right. Back to this question of who do you trust? Who does the, who does the public trust? To, to make decisions for them. Do they trust the state or, or federal policymakers? No, it's back to us. And, 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 you know, who do they hold accountable? Do they hold their congressmen accountable? Do they throw them out very often versus state versus local electeds? If you do the numbers, my understanding is, and there's been more recalls at the local level than, than at the federal level. So, lastly, Specifically, why should you come and work <laughs> at City Hall with us? Because we've got a PERS obligation that is going to bankrupt us at, at just about in any city in the state of California. That is the number one issue of the day for cities. Number two, in the City Riverside, we've got an electrical grid system that only has one connection to the state grid and we're having to go through Harupa Valley, and we are at war with Harupa Valley, actually. They declared war against us my first year in office because of a siting of an electrical line to get us a, another connection to the grid. <laughs> We've got an historic drought, homelessness I showed you, and on and on. So who's ready for that? Who's ready to jump on board in that ship and help us solve some of those you know, intractable problems like, like homelessness and, and traffic and otherwise? I think you're here for, for that, that very reason. And let me leave you with this, this challenge, and then we'll get out of here. In summary, everybody can do something to influence public policy and make a difference in the lives of others. You agree? Okay. And so that's why I got into this business in the first place. So ask yourself this question as you continue to figure out what you want to be when you grow up. What's your unique story? Everybody's got a story. If you haven't written it down, I, I, I challenge you to do that. Write it down. I told you some of my story and how far it goes back in the Save Riverside. How does that story intersect with a public, pro public policy problem that is relevant to today? I'm sure that you can make those connections. Have that story inform problem solving. Draw on your experiences and your values to make a difference in your neighborhood, your community, and obviously, therefore, in our world. If I could do the school thing over again, if I could do it over again, I would, instead of law school, go to public policy school. But I would take the education process more seriously, and I would practice policy analysis, that four-step, that six-step, that eight-step process that I showed you. I'd, I'd, pra I'd practice it more often through internships. I'd be hustling to get internships or do some volunteer work and ask them how you can, you know, <laughs> how you can do some policy analysis for the mayor of whatever town you live in or you're from. 
for a city councilman that you, you think is, is a good, good uh, model of elected officials, or through working your way up the ladder patiently and thoughtfully in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a business out there. You can always do more or you can do less. It's your choice. Uh, but California, as I think I've proven today, or you probably already know, is at a crossroads in determining, first of all, the demographics and thereby the community of its not-so-distant future. Some of the decisions we're making today are going to determine who desires, who comes and buys a house, who leaves our, our city, our state for, for another one. We need to ask ourselves some very important questions today. Some of these questions. Who do we want to welcome to our state? What are their demographics? Right? Policies matter. Immigration policy, education, housing, transportation. Who do we want to succeed in our state? Who do we want to keep in our state? Who do we want to incentivize to, to stay here? That talent dividend is so important. We can't... Uh, so answering these questions will, will be up to bright minds like yours and servant leaders like you. We can't escape the problems and issues coming our way, and that's why defining the problem, back to that first step, defining the problem is so important. Defining the problem before we can solve it. And so I hope you all walk away today with more knowledge about public policy and the decision-making process that goes with it, and I hope all of you will continue your interest in public policy, whether you decide to continue your formal education at UCR or otherwise, or wherever, wherever you go. I hope you, you go on to lead others in your neighborhood, in your businesses, in your family, uh, and in your world. And so I say thank you for inviting me here today, today again, Dean D. Lalliker and, and staff. Thank you for listening to me and for uh, letting me go through my long presentation, even though I went over time. Um, and thank you for engaging, engaging in things that matter. Um, for, our, for our continually growing public here in Riverside and in the state of California. So go Highlanders, go Highlanders. Questions, <laughs> questions. We have the microphone set up on the side, please. Oh, you have to go to the side. You can, you can yell it out to you. Yeah, I can you hear can you. Sit, I can uh, hear you. Yeah, either way, yeah. What do, you, what do you have? What are some questions? Hopefully I gave you some, enough information in there to ask questions. Yeah. Nobody wrote any questions down as I was... Over here, go ahead. Uh, I'm notorious for bringing up controversial topics. <laughs> uh, I, I would love your insight on where cannabis law is at the state and especially at public. Yeah, yeah, great question. Great question. I knew it was going to be asked, so I didn't put it into the, into the slide deck. But um, so, from, from experience, I, I can tell you that there's obviously there's ramifications for opening the door for, for cannabis business in a city. Uh, number one call for service when I was a, um, a councilman, and Ken, Ken can probably verify this, for a time was, was pot shops opening up in, in the neighborhood. Were you a three councilman when some of that was going on? Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so um, people in the neighborhoods were really upset about the comings and goings at all hours of individuals going to these dispensaries or pot shops with the green signs that would pop up all over town. And so, so it, it was a deliberate process for the city to, um, uh, with constituent uh, support, especially constituent support um, and public input, meaning we had uh, public meetings to determine what we were going to do with dispensaries in our city. And um, we ended up taking um, a, a dispensary, a medical dispensary, to court all the way to the Supreme Court to determine that cities do have local control over their land use uh, management. And so the city of, of Riverside, because of the impacts to neighborhoods, and again, that was informed by calls to their local elected officials, like me, saying, we don't like them in our neighborhood. They're causing too many problems versus solving you know, issues for individuals that need them for medicine, right? So we, we outlawed them in our city. I'm talking about medical dispensaries 10 years ago, okay? Now, 
Then we were challenged on the ballot. So there was an initiative placed on the local ballot and the voters decided 50, it was pretty, it was in the 50s, mid 50s, 55%. The voters said, we don't want medical dispensaries in our city. And so when this recreational use came recently, we, we already had all of that information and support behind us from the public. So what, do, you know, what, what creates political decision making, what pl creates political will, ultimately when we have to push the button on the dais? Yeah, public opinion informs that. And we had plenty of a public opinion. Um, th there was a statewide vote for recreational use. We looked at that too, but it was kind of apples and oranges in terms of the data. And so the council, uh, voted pretty, pretty. Uh, um, I would say, you know, kind of party line vote. I think it was four three or five two, to not allow recreational use. So there is no, uh, no pot shops, no dispensaries are allowed in our city. And that's retail. That's micro business. That's even warehousing it or or distributing it in our city. The only thing that's allowed is cannabis oil testing because there was um, a laboratory that was doing it for for many years. And so we allowed that to continue to occur because uh, they came down actually and petitioned their council. They came down to a council meeting and said, hey, we've been here forever. We've got great jobs and we've been doing this. And, you know, if we lose this contract, we're going to lose good employ employment in, in your city. Don't you think you should keep it? So that's where we are in Riverside. I think it's the biggest business that's hit California since maybe the, the gold rush or actually the, the orange industry. It's probably the biggest business that we've seen opportunity there. And so some, some cities are looking at it as a business opportunity and opening their doors to it because they're going to get more revenue through taxation and, and otherwise. So um, it's a big deal statewide, but in Riverside, it's, um, it's not allowed. Good question. And that, you know, back to defining the problem, we define the problem of, of impacts on, on neighborhoods, right? And it was a lot more cost than benefit when it came to that. If we would have defined the problem of you know needing revenue because we were in a deficit or you know, then maybe we would look at it a little bit differently and see that as a revenue source, like other cities have, Desert Hot Springs, some other desert cities, and said, you know what, we need that revenue. So that's why that first step is so important, identifying the problem for your community, your neighborhood, your city. What else? Sure. What else? Yeah. So you discussed uh, working with housing as the mayor of Riverside, but I also noticed you worked at the HUD uh, prior to becoming mayor of Riverside. So can you discuss the differences in dealing with those issues uh, from the federal and the local level? Sure. Sure. So I worked at the at United States Department of Her um, Housing and Urban Development. I, it was mainly an economic development in the what's called the Empowerment Zone Initiative poverty fighting, $100 million to 10 cities and $10 million to 100 cities. And so we would track that money and where it was invested and, um, and see best practices and then share those with, with the cities around the country. And so, so it wasn't in housing specifically, but I did get to see what housing did for people and it provided them stability and, and places um, you know, to raise their family. And there was, there was um, uh, some new programs at HUD. I think one of them was Hope Six. So instead of building projects, high rises of housing, there was a lot more lower intensity two and three story housing with amenities back to what do people want? Where do people want to live? You know, they don't want to live all together in one place, you know, that's blighted. They want to live integrated into neighborhoods around the city. And so HUD changed, HUD had changed their policy of housing and where those, those, where the Section 8 um, housing and or public housing should be located, as well as what amenities should be in there. They, did, they put more community gardens, uh, more open space, more parks, um, and, and playgrounds for the, for the kids. And, and so I saw that shift. I saw that shift occurring um, in, the, in the 90s. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't have, I don't have as much specific knowledge on that, but I did get to see some of it, and I got to tour some of it, in in cities, you know, like, uh, Columbus, uh, Ohio, and and uh, Tennessee. What was the what was the city boy, some poverty, 
poverty stricken in Mississippi and Tennessee and um, Knoxville and and I got to go out and see these these new products, these new housing products, and how how different um, the 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 constituents that were living there, you know, how they re responded to that housing um, that was different than than the projects, the massive you know ten twenty story housing projects that in big cities like Chicago and in New York. What else? What else? Other questions. Hi, I'm Sikameen. I'm an undergrad student here at UCR. Um, and I wanted to go back to your question. Um, you asked why aren't millennials you know, buying houses? Um, and I just wanted to like, bring up, like, just as a college student, my personal experience, you know, people my age, especially in California, aren't even thinking about buying houses because you know, we're still paying off our student loans. Right. Um, and you know, I have peers who are food insecure. They're not really thinking about the amenities that they're right. offered when it comes to buying an apartment. You know, they're thinking um, how they're going to survive. So um, my question was, you know, and you also um, offered the solution of um, more urban houses or urban centers, but those also run the risk of, you know, pushing out low-income communities that are already in those areas. So my question was, how do we deal with these kinds of issues and create tangible solutions without being scared of, you know, the complexity of an issue? You gotta act at some point, right? That goes back to the final step. And we can study things all day long, but we don't know how, we don't know, we don't know the, the consequences. There are consequences, like you mentioned, there's gonna be gentrification sometimes. Um, you know, is that always bad? Is gentrification always bad? I know it's a big word and, and, and you know, people are gonna use it, but what if those people that lived in that neighborhood you know, were offered higher education as a part of a move, or they were offered a better environment to live in in the innovation district, right? And I'm just, I'm just throwing this out there. So at some point, we have to act. We have to make those tough decisions as elected officials to what we believe. I don't, I don't think you can ever, I don't think any elected official is making a decision to degrade their city. You know, why'd you make that decision? Well, I wanted to hurt. I wanted to hurt that neighborhood. I wanted to kill kill off that, you know, that area, right? I wanted it to go blighted. I I don't think anybody gets into this business to do that. They want to make decisions that are going to improve society, quality of life of the residents of the neighborhoods. You know, and. So, you know, coming from that foundational belief, you know, sometimes we have to give some grace to the decision makers and we have to watch the progress. And, and, and progress sometimes takes time. Maybe it's going to be five or ten years before that area really sees the effect and the rising tide lifts all boats. You know, right now we're having some conflict at, at City Hall between council members from the outskirts versus downtown. Why are we putting so much attention to downtown? And why is so much investment going on downtown? Well, right now it's private investment going on downtown. It's not even public investment. We did that from 2007 to 2012 in the Renaissance, $1.4 billion of public investment. And now there's $1.4 billion of private investment that has gone on since 2012. Okay, and so that was a policy from previous councils to put that money into the Renaissance in downtown, again, 10 years ago, and we're having an effect today that's positive, but yeah, is, is downtown changing? Certainly is, the restaurants are changing, okay? Food lab, right, we have a lot more uh, happenings along Main Street, um, you know, but, but could there be a restaurant that goes, goes away or a shop, Mrs. Tiggy Winkles, you know, for example, that's been there forever because rents are going to go up because of this? That, that could happen. And that, yeah, that, that's going to upset some people and, and make us sad. But, but ultimately, 
you know, what's, what's the alternative? Is do nothing an alternative? That's typically one of the, the things we study in public policy, the do nothing alternative. So if we were to do nothing downtown in terms of improvements to the Fox Theater Convention Center and those things that we did, the Main Street Mall, okay, then instead of having gentrification possibly, then we would just have um, boarded up you know, shops on Main Street, right? So there, those, and, 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 I know, and I know there's in between there. There's gray area there. I'm not saying it's black and white. But does that answer your question? That decisions are hard, definitely, to make. And, and there are going to be, I, I hate to call it winners and losers, OK? I, I, I had to, man, I'm, I'm going on too long, huh? No? We got time? Um, when I was a councilman, we put underpasses underneath railroads. Is that a good thing to do? Yeah, makes life a lot safer and quieter in those neighborhoods. Talk about quality life improvements. You know, I have trains honking in the middle of the night. One of those neighborhoods I lived in. And so we did those four or five times around the city, and one of them was on Magnolia Avenue, the main street for businesses. And we displaced 10 businesses. And I, I had to go tell them that because I was the councilman. I wanted to go tell them myself. And so Jules, I'll never forget Jules Muffler. Jules Muffler. I had to go and... They, the, 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 the wife, business, they were, you know, business partners, husband and wife that owned this, Jules Muffler, she started bawling, crying. I'm sitting there looking around, anybody going to help me out with this? <laughs> I think I had Belinda Graham, assistant city manager with me, and we're telling her she's got to move, but we're going we're gonna to give you money to move to a different location, and it's going to be a bigger location, and it's going to be on the freeway, visibility. You know, 100,000 people driving by instead of 50,000 people driving by. Is that going to improve your business? It's not going to be in the same spot anymore. But, right, but, and, and, and. And so we're trying to explain this to her. But she's still crying because that's her business. And she, that was her baby. And they, you know. So, so I've been through some of that gentrification for public investment, you know, um, in neighborhoods. And it's difficult. It's hard. It's ugly. It's messy. It's tearful. So anyway, just an example, Jules Muffler. And it's, and it's alive and well, by the way. And they've grown. And they're pretty happy right now. They've never come back and thanked me, you know, for, for displacing their business, moving the location. They typically don't come back and thank you, but they're thriving. What else? What else? Did that it? Yeah. Oh. You discussed how one of your main responsibilities as mayor is to represent Riverside, Riverside uh, internationally. Uh, what are some approaches to urban policy that you've noticed abroad that you feel we are lacking or could benefit from here in the United States? Oh, man. Well, renewable energy, especially in Europe, Germany. Most recently, I took a trip to Erlang and our sister city there. Um, transportation infrastructure, especially bikes, the lifestyle that they have where the majority of them bike to work or bike to school versus, you know, two or three percent maybe in, in, our, in our region at, the, at best. Um, and then renewable energy, solar panels, and, and, and on and on. Um, sustain of sustainability in, in, in Europe specifically, their policies on, on sustainability and, and um, you know, when they, when they build something in, in Germany, they have to, and we're doing this somewhat in the county now in terms of, of land development, whatever many square feet or acres of development, they have to go out and buy green space to, to keep that open space, you know, clean and green, um, um, you know, feel uh, around their city. And so, that's a big deal, which slows growth. You know, there's, there's both sides to that, that story, where there's a lot of investment that would like to go into our sister city in, in Erlang in Germany, but um, the, the, the growth mandates that they have are too uh, extreme. Um, and so they're, they're losing talent. They're losing opportunities for investment. Uh, because of some of the policies that they have locally to trade off 
you know, land development with, with open green space. Um, yeah, but, but bike infrastructure especially is incredible over there. They've got signals for bikes. They've got the half of the sidewalk if you're not paying attention. <laughs> you know, you're walking in the bike lane and they're ringing at you and yelling at you. Um, I, as, a, as a bicyclist, I, I love it because we've, our, our bike lanes are all rutted up and uh, much more difficult to ride around. And then, yeah, and then like I said, the, the solar. California is going more solar. 2020, all houses have to have solar panels, but, um, you know, that's, it's, it's been that way in Europe for many years. Good questions. Good thinking. Thank you all for sticking around okay. Friday afternoon. Thank Grab you, Rusty. some coffee. Look like there's some, some, some tasty, uh, healthy food over there. All right. Thank you, Rusty. And we'll give him a round of applause, and then we're just going to go... Okay. We're just going to proceed straight to the reception now, and please stick around. We have coffee, we have juice, uh, fruits, cookies, things like that, so please join us at this reception.